hi guys and welcome to our third BioX Tech webinar. Um, last time we learned about xenotransplantation and how that might be able to solve our organ shortage issues. Now imagine sometime in the future we can manufacture a heart on demand for a specific patient. Um, we're not quite there yet, but Dr. Bliley has done some amazing work in that direction and we're so fortunate to be able to have her here today to discuss with us her exciting and groundbreaking work on 3D bioprinted hearts. I discussed with Dr. Bliley and we will take questions after the presentation. I will be the moderator. You can either use the raise your hand feature in Zoom and I will call on you to ask your question or alternatively, you can type your question into the chat and I will ask your question on your behalf. Now I will kick this off. I'm honored to introduce Dr. Bliley. Dr. Bliley earned her BS from Duquesne University in 2010. She then completed her master's in medical sciences from Boston University in 2012. In her master's thesis, she investigated bioactive growth factor delivery from polymer-based microspheres into decellularized nerve allografts to enhance peripheral nerve regeneration. She was then hired by the University of Pittsburgh where she worked for four years in an academic research lab under the guidance of Dr. Casey Mara and Dr. Peter Rubin. Her main research focus was various drug slash growth factor slash cell delivery techniques for soft tissue engineering. She returned to her studies to pursue her PhD in biomedical engineering in 2016 at Carnegie Mellon University in the Regeneration Biomaterials and Therapeutics Group under the direction of Dr. Adam Feinberg and completed her PhD in fall 2021. Her main research interests include, bi include engineering cardiac tissues with 3D bioprinting and other advanced biofabrication techniques with a specific emphasis on incorporating cues from early heart development, like mechanical loading. Dr. Bliley, the floor is yours. Thank you so much uh, for that kind uh, introduction and this invitation. Um, I think what you guys are doing is really cool and I hope that you guys will have a lot of questions for me. Um, so you can see my slides, I sound okay, everything's good. Yes, everything's good. Okay, um, so I did have a very nice intro there, uh, but I'm currently a postdoctoral fellow in Adam Feinberg's lab at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, so I stayed on as a postdoc after I received my PhD to just uh, finish up some work. And today I'm gonna be talking about 3D bioprinting uh, the human heart. Um, I also should mention I have a dog, so he might start barking, and in that case, I'm going to mute for a second, but then I'll continue on. Um, so I do want to talk about my background, even though you gave that nice intro, because I think as a high school student, um, I would have never expected that I would be where I am today. And kind of what I did was I just sort of followed things that really interested me and that I was very passionate about. Um, so throughout my childhood, uh, I grew up in a very small town in upstate New York. Uh, I went to a K through 12 public school with only about 200 students. Uh, so it would be really easy for me to say that that was a very rural life. Uh, but I did have really great teachers. And from a young age, I was always very interested in science and medicine and how the body works. Uh, so for my undergraduate de degree, I decided um, to go to Duquesne University, which is in Pittsburgh. Um, and when it came time to pick a degree, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, so I eventually decided on health management systems because I was interested in going to medical school, uh, but hadn't really done any sort of in-depth thinking about what I wanted to do with my life. So for those of you that don't know, health management systems is a degree that prepares you for administration in a healthcare setting. Uh, but some interesting things is that while at Duquesne, I realized I was much more interested in my science classes than my business, finance, or administrative classes. Uh, so I actually took on additional science classes like cell and molecular biology. Uh, I also was able to take an anatomy cadaver lab. And I also performed research um, in Dr. Sarah Woodley's laboratory. And this really excited me about science. Um, I really enjoyed research a lot. Um, it kind of set me on the path uh, to pursue a career in research. Um, so when I did graduate, um, I thought I wanted to go to medical school, but I also really like research. So I applied to a post-bac program in Boston, 
uh, which allowed me to take medical school courses and um, also had a unique part that allowed me to do research anywhere I wanted. Uh, so basically, I did what anyone does when they don't know what they want to do. I Googled a bunch of labs, um, and I found ones that I was interested in, and then I emailed uh, the professors and asked if they had any available slots. Uh, where I ended up was actually back at the University of Pittsburgh, um, investigating cell and growth factor delivery to regenerate uh, peripheral nerves, um, and I fell in love with it. I actually stayed on an additional four years after completing my master's work, um, and then I was working as a research fellow. So after all of that, uh, and that combined experience and time, I knew I wanted to have my own lab someday, um, and I knew I wasn't going to be able to do that unless I got a PhD. Um, so I ended up pursuing a PhD in biomedical engineering at Carnegie Mellon University, and some of my research will be what I will be talking about today. So let's move on to the meat of my talk, which is really uh, the motivation for building these heart muscle tissues. Um, and really that this is because the heart has this limited capacity to repair itself following significant damage or disease. And this can sometimes result in dramatic structural and functional remodeling, um, as you can see in the image on the right in the two different examples of heart failure. With really the main outcome in both being that the heart is not able to pump enough blood to meet the body's demands. The only long-term treatment for heart failure is a heart transplant, uh, but unfortunately, there really are not enough donor organs to help all those who need a transplant. Um, and it sounds like you guys had a previous talk the last time about heart transplant, so I don't need to go into that much detail. Uh, but I, what I do want you guys to notice is that this is a graph of um, weightless survival probability. So we have survival pro probability on the left as a function of days on the waitlist. And this red curve here are the sickest patients on the waitlist. And what I want you to notice is that after about one year, these patients have about a 48% chance of survival. Um, and it's important to keep in mind that these are the patients who actually qualify for the waitlist. So there are many patients that are actually excluded um, and are not, uh, are not able to receive a transplant. Thus, really, there is this need to develop therapeutic alternatives that are capable of repairing and replacing the human heart. And engineered heart muscle tissues really have emerged as this in vitro tool and even as an in vivo therapeutic option where you can basically obtain these somatic cells uh, like fibroblasts from patients and do a process called reprogramming to the, these cells to what's called an induced pluripotent stem cell. These reprogrammed cells uh, are become much more like the cells observed during embryonic development and can go on to become all of the different tissues and organs present in your body, including heart muscle cells and cardiomyocytes. These patient-specific cardiomyocytes can then be made into engineered heart muscle tissues to study either cardiotoxicity, uh, to model disease, um, or even as an in vivo therapy uh, to repair the damaged heart. However, one key challenge we currently face is that current fabrication approaches are unable to build a fully functional human heart for replacement. So what kind of fabrication approaches are needed to build tissues and organs? Uh, so this probably depends on what you're trying to build, but if we're thinking about building the adult heart, we know we have more than 10 major extracellular matrix proteins or ECM proteins, and these are the materials that are uh, found between cells. We know we have more than 11 cell types, varying elastic moduli, and a multi-scale vascular network ranging from five microns to five millimeters in diameter. Thus, we really need a biofabrication approach that can spatially control the composition, the microstructure, the macrostructure, the mechanics, the cellularity, et cetera, to make these tissues and organs. And 3D printing is one potential approach to build heart tissues and organs for repair and replacement. So you guys are probably familiar with traditional 3D printing or fused deposition modeling, which relies on the softening of a thermoplastic material as it's heated through an extruder. Uh, this softened material can then be deposited layer by layer to create a 3D structure 
as you see in this movie on the left here. However, because these thermoplastics are much more rigid uh, when compared to materials in your body, like cells and extracellular matrix, it's difficult to use this traditional 3D printing approach uh, that was developed for thermo thermoplastics. For instance, uh, if we try to print something like collagen in air, so collagen is the major extracellular matrix protein in your body, it just collapses under its own weight. Uh, for example, in this video, we're attempting to print a cube, but instead end up with this sort of rounded hydrogel-like puddle. Uh, and this is further exemplified in the images on the bottom where you can see that as the number of layers of soft material increases, uh, you tend to get this deformation and collapse of the structure. So how do we go about leveraging the advantages of 3D printing to print soft tissues and organs? Uh, we don't wanna print a blob like Jell-O. Uh, we wanna print something complex uh, like this vascular tree that you can see on the bottom here. So is there a way to print these soft materials like cells and extracellular matrix and maintain high shape fidelity? So one approach to think about this would be um, instead of making a tissue, tissue materials printable in air, um, can we make an environment that makes any material printable? So an alternative approach would be to use a technique developed in our lab, a uh, term freeform reversible embedding of suspended hydrogels or fresh. Now, this is a 3D printing technique that allows for the printing of soft tissue-like materials or what we term uh, bioinks. Uh, so here, a bioink, uh, which is shown in green, is extruded into this gelatin microparticle support bath, which is shown in yellow. This support bath has a unique, um, uh, is unique in that it's a yield stress fluid. Uh, so this is similar to some how like ketchup behaves, where you have to apply a sufficient force to get it to flow like a fluid. For instance, uh, if you've ever had a glass ketchup bottle and you have to hit the side to basically get the ketchup to flow to the bottom of the bottle. However, once this force is removed, the bath tends to act like a solid. This is important because it enables the support of the extruded bioink in place while gelation or cross-linking occurs. Finally, uh, because it's the support bath is sacrificial, we can melt it to release our final 3D printed structure. For instance, uh, this video shows the printing of an alginate hy hydrogel, which is dyed blue for visualization. Uh, and the gelatin microparticles for bath is shown in yellow. We can then melt the support bath uh, to release our final 3D printed structure. And in this case, it's the letter CMU. So if we look more closely at our support bath, what we see is that we have two different components. We have these tiny sphere-like structures called gelatin microparticles. And this allows for that yield stress phenomena that I was previously talking about, as well as the thermal reversibility uh, to remove the print from the, uh, the support bath. But there's also this fluid phase between these particles. And this is important because in this fluid phase, we can incorporate a wide range of cross-linking or gelation mechanisms into it. For instance, if we intend to print something like collagen, uh, we incorporate a strong pH neutralizing buffer. Or if we want to print something like fibrinogen, we incorporate thrombin into the support bath. By using multiple extruders, we can print multiple bioinks into the same uh, construct. And these bioinks can have different cross-linking mechanisms. So for instance, uh, in this construct, we have collagen, which is shown in red. We have alginate, which is shown in blue. And this has an ionic cross-linking mechanism. We have fibrin, which is shown in pink. Um, and we have this methacrylated hyaluronic acid, uh, which is shown in green, and this is actually uh, photo cross-linkable. So how do we get to the point where we can build a full heart? So first, we need to be able to build patient-specific volumetric scaffolds with precise anatomical architecture. We also need to be able to build valves that control blood flow through the heart, as well as the blood vessel components that deliver nutrients and gas to keep this heart muscle tissue alive. Sorry, that's my dog. 
<laughs> and finally, we need to be able to build a dense myocardium consisting of heart muscle cells uh, that provides for the contractile component or pumping capacity of the heart. And with Fresh, uh, we have been actually able to 3D print many of these components. So for instance, uh, we can take models of whole hearts uh, derived from MRI, um, and this is shown on the left here, and actually scale them down to the size of about a neonatal heart. Um, and we can print these entirely out of type one collagen. And if we look at a cross section of these hearts, what we can see is that we have defined uh, ventricular chambers, as well as these um, trabeculae like structures. Um, you guys should be able to appreciate uh, the detail that these prints have. Um, for instance, so this is actually micro CT images of these printed hearts at different section. And similarly, we can see the right ventricle, the left ventricle, and these trabeculae. Um, and if you're familiar with 3D printing, you can also see that we have some 3D printed rectangular infill here as well. Also, if you look at another section, you can see we ha also have valve features. For instance, we have this pulmonary valve with leaflets, as well as this aortic valve with leaflets here. We can also use this to build whole heart mimics that are actually the size of an adult heart. Um, and this is shown in this video here. Um, so this actually um, is printed out of alginate. Um, but we printed this at full scale, so it is actually the size of an adult heart. Um, and the idea here is that this can potentially be used for pre-surgical planning um, uh, from patient-specific um, MRIs. We've also been able to build other functional components of the heart, like valves, uh, and this allows for unidirectional fluid flow through the heart. Uh, for instance, uh, this is a computer-aided design model or CAD model of a tri-leaflet valve. And on the right, we have, um, we have this uh, valve printed entirely out of type one collagen. If we cross-link these using gluter aldehyde, which is actually what's used um, on pig valves that are eventually implanted in humans, you can actually see that this valve, we can handle it. Um, you can actually separate the leaflets with your fingers. So they're actually very robust. And when we put them under pulsatile flow, we see that these valve leaflets, uh, which are shown here, actually open um, under pulsatile flow. Um, and this is actually how a normal valve would operate. We can also computationally generate vascular networks to be able to provide nutrients to developing heart muscle. Um, so here is STL um, showing computationally generated vasculature here off of this um, large uh, right coronary artery, which is shown here. Here is the print, which is printed entirely out of type 1 collagen, and we can perfuse it using a blood mimic, as you can see in the video on the right. So now, um, so far I've been talking about generating acellular structures of the heart and its associated components, but how do we incorporate the contractile heart muscle cells that are responsible for its pumping capacity? So what we can do is take those induced pluripotent stem cells that I described in the beginning. We can add some factors that mimic factors observed during development of the heart. And after a period of about 14 days, we get spontaneously beating cardiomyocytes in the dish, as you can see in the video uh, on the bottom. With this method, we can generate simplified contractile pumps. So for instance, this is a heart tube, which we can print out of type one collagen. And as you can see from these images, we have an open lumen um, on both cross sections. And we, when we actually wrap heart muscle tissue around it, you can see that these heart muscle tissues will actually spontaneously contract just like your heart muscle would. We can also evaluate the contractile activity of this tube by injecting fluorescent beads into the tube lumen and then tracking their movement over time with particle tracking. So if we zoom into the area just outside the tube lumen and we look at one cycle of contraction, what we see is that the heart tube is able to contract and generate pressure in the lumen to displace these beads away from the lumen. 
However, these beads do tend to flow back to the lumen during heart tissue relaxation. However, despite this, uh, we do see a minimal unidirectional displacement of these beads over time. Um, and this is represented by these green beads, which are free floating in solution, which are moving progressively outside of the lumen. And can, compared to these red beads, which are embedded in the tube wall and actually show no net displacement over time. We can also 3D print these cells and ECM components directly uh, to create simplified ventricle-like structures. Um, and how we do this is we actually print these collagen walls, which are flanking this cell anchoring region, which contains uh, cardiomyocytes and cardiac fibroblasts. If we look at an image of the cross-section of the ventricle wall, what you see here is this green staining surrounded by this pink collagen. Um, and this green stain is actually for the contractile apparatus of the cell or the sarcomeres. Um, so we're basically showing that we can print these and they show this um, intended structure of cardiomyocytes. Not only can we print these cells, uh, but they're also functional. So in this video, uh, we can actually see basically a bright light traveling across the tissue. So this is calcium flowing through the cells because we've stained it with a fluorescent indicator dye. Um, and this calcium is what drives the heart muscle contraction. We can see that it follows electrical pacing as well. Um, and then now there's a top-down view where we can actually see spontaneous contraction of the tissue. Um, and when the tissue is paced, what I hope you can appreciate is that the chamber is becoming smaller with each contraction. And in some ways, this is similar to how a ventricle would operate. So building on these previous foundations, how can we use this to our, extend our capabilities with RESH? So, so far I've talked about building these simplified heart structures, but how do we think about building more complex structures? For instance, in the heart, you have these heart muscle cells, which are aligned in different directions. Um, and this enables for efficient squeezing and pumping of fluid out of the heart. This alignment is also important um, in other muscle structures. Uh, for example, skeletal muscle, where you have different architectures, um, which allow for uh, the cells to translate force in different directions. Here, we can make models of these skeletal muscle um, of the skeletal muscle architectures and then print them out of collagen directly. Um, and what we see is that when we incorporate the cellular components, which are shown in pink here, um, you actually see that they start to align to these architectures, which is very similar to what skeletal muscle looks like in vivo. Uh, and this work was done by Maria Stang in the lab, as well as Andrew, Andrew Lee. We can also build bioreactors to perfuse these tissues. So this is shown in the video on the left, um, and the, basically the tissue is being sandwiched between the bioreactor, and we're gonna zoom into this two tube construct, and you can see that we can flow one blue liquid in one direction and another red liquid in the other direction. We can also print endothelial cells directly, and these are what's responsible for forming the capillary networks within your body. Um, and we can use this proangiogenic and vasculogenic bioinks to form these capillary-like structures um, that are observed in your body. Um, and this work is being done by Andrew Hudson in the lab. Finally, and though this is like a little bit off topic here, I thought it was important to bring up that we don't just work on the heart, we also work on other tissues. Um, we can also use this um, to basically try to regenerate uh, tissues such as wounds. So here we're really focused on basically taking a CT scan or MRI of a wound, and then we can basically create a model of basically the defect. And from there we can create a patient specific wound patch. These wound patches can then be implanted directly onto a wound with the hope here that um, these may be able to heal wounds faster. And this work is being done by Annie Berry, as well as Josh Tashman and Dan Chworsky in the lab. So as I previously uh, was talking, or as I will talk about, um, an important part 
in bringing these tissues to clinical translation is developing in-process monitoring and validation to basically say we're printing what we say we can print, um, as well as if there's any errors in the print, we can actually detect them early. And for this, we've been using a sort of imaging technique called optical coherence tomography. And we've actually developed a clear support bath, which allows for imaging of the printing process while it's occurring. And we can actually print and image these small um, acellular kidney-like structures, um, as you can see in this video on the right here. So in summary, I was able to show that FRESH really enables the printing of various components of the heart, um, as well as other tissues. And our next steps are to really focus on building these large, anatomically accurate, functional heart muscle pumps. Uh, we would also like to translate these to large animal preclinical models and develop pre uh, commercial applications via biomanufactured devices uh, and tissues. And I said I would give some advice uh, if I was going to give advice to myself when I was in high school. Um, and I thought a lot about what I what I was uh, thinking when I was your age. So first, um, I think it's really important to follow things that you're passionate about, which I already kind of previously mentioned. And once you find that thing you're passionate about, really work hard, uh, really work hard at it. Try to reach your goals. Um, I truly believe this sets people apart. Um, there are a lot of smart people out there, um, but I not everyone wants to work as hard to reach their goals. Second, um, don't be stressed uh, about where you are in life. Uh, when I was your age, I really had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, and even into my master's, I was still unsure about what I wanted to do. Uh, this is okay. It's totally normal. It's also great if you already know what you want to do, because then you don't have to mess around, but it's okay to not know. Um, so don't stress. Uh, try to enjoy the journey along the way because uh, truly I was exposed to a lot of really amazing things and I think it made me a better scientist to actually take the time um, post-masters doing research um, as well as doing a master's. Third, it's really important to try new things um, and understand it's okay to not like them. Uh, for instance, it was okay that I tried health management and I didn't like it. What was mo the most important was my response to be active and look for something that I did enjoy. enjoy. So once I realized that health management wasn't for me, I took the essential steps to find out what was for me. Finally, um, it's really important to ask for opportunities and know that the worst someone can say is no. Um, and I think this is really important. Uh, not everyone asks for opportunities uh, and not everyone asks for what they want. Um, and I think a lot of the success I've had um, in my research career is because I was willing to ask. Um, also, on the flip side, know that there are other opportunities out there if someone does say no. And if someone says no to you, then you probably didn't want that opportunity in the first place. Um, so you should be looking at other opportunities as well. Um, so that was it for my, for my advice. Um, I do want to thank everyone in the Feinberg Lab, um, as this was not just my work. Um, many of us contribute to this work described in this presentation. I also want to thank our funding sources outlined here, um, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Awesome. This is actually the perfect segue to our first question that we have received. Um, what tips slash advice do you have for high school students in discovering lifelong passions? Oh, that's a great question. So, Honestly, I think it's just, you guys have access to like, well, so when I was growing up, the internet was a thing, but it wasn't as big of a thing until I got into college. So I would say my best advice now is you basically have the world at your fingertips. If you want to learn something, there are free courses online and you can go and learn it and you can find if you like it. Um, I would also look, there are a lot of programs in, um, well, not a lot, but there are programs in high school that you can uh, look into if you're interested in looking into 3D bioprinting um, 
or um, tissue engineering. Uh, but I would say most of those, uh, most experience you'll probably get is when you're in college. Um, and in that way, I would just put myself out there. I would look into research labs if that's what you're interested in doing. And I would ask around and I would try to get as much experience as I can as possible. Um, so I think it's a combination of using what resources you have, like the internet. Um, and then also, I'm sure you guys have, you guys have families and they probably know of um, different opportunities out there uh, or you have friends and teachers. So say the things that you're interested in and maybe they'll be able to help you out. Awesome, thank you. And then the next question is, um, in your opinion, how does 3D bioprinting compare to xenotransplantation? Is it a superior solution or an alternative one to the problem we're concerned with? Um, so I would say that it's an alternative solution. Um, obviously, xenotransplantation um, has a lot of advantages, right? Because um, it's a fully functioning organ. Like if we could figure out, uh, get a way for xenotransplantation to work, which some recent work actually suggests it does, um, then that would be great. But I would think in my head, it's an alternative, um, an alternative uh, basic, basically method to actually form hearts um, or other tissues and organs for repair and replacement. All right, thank you. Um, what has been the most difficult step in the research and development process? Oh, that's a really good question. Uh, so I should have actually put this on my advice slide. Um, so if you guys are interested in, I think this applies to a lot of different careers, um, but specifically in research, you have to be okay I don't like calling it failure, but you have to be okay with failing and look at failure as like an opportunity and that you learn something. Um, and from that perspective, I think, I think a lot about uh, the stem cell differentiation that we do to get the heart muscle cells. So it's a very, very challenging um, technique that takes time. So it takes about two weeks to get the heart muscle cells that we need. And then we actually do purify them because there's other cells within that population for an additional week. So three weeks until we actually get cells that we need. So it takes time and it also takes tremendous amount of effort. So for instance, we are in the lab every single day of the week taking care of these cells. Um, so I would say that is the most challenging. Um, but along the way, there's gonna be bumps in the road, especially if you pursue research. And so my best advice is to get okay with those bumps in the road. Thank you. And Kevin has asked, um, for bioengineered organs, do you still have to consider the factors such as antigen matching, like when trying to find matches for organ transplants or are bioengineered organs more versatile in the way that they can be matched to many more patients? So that's a great question too. So there's, what's kind of great about what we uh, specifically do is we can take a biopsy from a patient and generate patient specific cells. So they actually shouldn't be rejected. Um, and then a lot of the materials that we use that aren't cellular materials, for example, the extracellular matrix proteins, um, have actually been used clinically for a long time. So collagen, um, there are a lot of acellular dermal matrices um, and they're not typically rejected as long as there's cellular components. So in that way, um, it is a superior method, I would say, um, in comparison to um, the xenotransplantation. So it's more versatile. Thank you. And would you say that in the future, of course, is it possible that 3D bioprinting can, 3D bioprinted hearts can be even better than regular hearts? For example, you can augment them in a certain way to um, last longer, pump harder, maybe. So that's a really cool idea, like a robo heart or something. Um, 
Yeah. I mean, so what I like to think about is, um, I guess when you ask me a question like this, I think about evolution. So a lot of, um, hearts and different organisms or even tissues are specifically um, designed through evolution for a specific animal. And sometimes they're actually better for specific purposes. Um, what we can do is kind of tailor that. We could use maybe different, um, I'm trying to think of a specific example. Um, we could use different finite element modeling, which could basically create uh, better better tissues, potentially, um, potentially ones that can repair themselves. That would be really cool. Um, but challenging. Um, so may maybe if you had an MI, maybe you could have a portion of it that would repair itself following damage. Um, that would be pretty amazing. Um, so yeah. Interesting. Thank you. And let's see. Can you think of a specific project that was your personal favorite and why, both in your career and at our age in high school? <laughs> uh, man, I just love bioprinting um, heart muscles. <laughs> I would say hands down, this is my favorite. So much so that I'm like having trouble uh, like thinking about moving on to a different organ system and I probably won't. Um, it, there's just something about it. There's something about creating something in a dish that's, you know, contracting, uh, pumping a little bit of fluid. It's quite amazing. Um, yeah, so that would be my favorite project. Thank you. And also nerves, um, nerves are attached and help these muscles function, right? Are, is there a way that, um, you can incorporate the nervous system and the nerve sort of into your 3D bioprinted hearts, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. So um, the heart's kind of unique in that um, it will actually contract on its own. So it has these nodal cells, which drive um, contraction throughout the heart. Um, it does have innervation from uh, the sympathetic and parasympathetic, ne parasympathetic nervous system to speed up or slow down. Um, but if we're thinking about um, in terms of skeletal muscle, uh, there have been people that have basically put uh, nerve cells uh, in close to or in contact with muscle cells, and they will spontaneously form what's called a neuromuscular junction, uh, which uh, is basically responsible for the nerve input basically causing a muscle contraction. So it is possible. Uh, which is really cool. Um, so there are some things that are very amazing to me that cells just know how to do. Uh, they know how to, I guess, on a very small scale, reorganize themselves. Um, it's just they struggle at the larger scale, um, like the scale we need to when we're trying to print a actual heart muscle structure. Wow, thank you. Um, so do you think there are any ethical implications to using bioprinted organs? Uh, so this is a good question. Um, it depends, I guess, on what cell types you would potentially use. Um, right now I'm saying we're using induced pluripotent stem cells, which means they're derived from the patient. Uh, usually it's a, a biopsy or a blood sample is that taken, is taken. And then these cells, uh, have some factors added to them. And then basically they're turned into that induced pluripotent state, and then they can go on to differentiate into all the cells uh, within your body. Um, so in that case, I feel like there's very little ethical considerations to consider. Um, however, uh, there are people that work with embryonic stem cells, um, and I think there are a little bit more ethical Im uh, implications to using those types of cells. Um, so, Yes and no, it depends on what cell type you're using. Interesting. And when testing, what liquid do you use to simulate the unique viscosity and properties of blood? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, so in that video, it's glycerol. Um, but there are a lot of blood mimics out there. Um, so gl glycerol is a little bit more viscous than, um, than you know, water, obviously. Um, so 
it works pretty well as a blood mimic, um, but there uh, are other ones out there. I can't think of them off the top of my head, but there are, are other ones. Interesting, thank you. Um, we're still waiting for questions to come in. So if anyone wants to ask any questions or would like to verbalize their question, please raise your hand and share your question. I have a question. Are you guys all from the same school or different schools? Uh, so we're from different schools. This is a Pan School Club and we're from, a lot of us are from Whitman. I'm from Whitman personally. And there are people from Poolsville High School, from Georgetown Day School, and lots of different schools. Some people are even from middle school. So everyone okay. is very, it's a diverse um, audience. Okay. Yeah, you guys feel free to uh, ask questions. I'm happy to answer them. Um, yes, please share. Uh, did you have to take any technology or engineering classes? Um, so, yes. Uh, so, when I got to, uh, when I got to Carnegie Mellon, I did all, a lot of engineering classes. Um, so, yes, I did. Um, but engineering is really cool. And I feel like engineering, you know, organs is even cooler. Uh so it's just applying those principles to engineering organs. Thank you. Um, Katie has asked, how, um, are you able to elaborate more on why embryo cells create added ethical implications? Um, sure, uh, I think it's honestly because uh, people, well, I shouldn't say, um, so normally, um, these uh, cells are, embryonic stem cells are isolated from a part of uh, basically discarded, um, discard, they're not discarded embryos, but they are uh, discarded, I think it's blastocysts from, I might be saying this wrong, uh, from patients that undergo IVF. Um, and they basically take out the inner cell mass. Now these patients have said, oh, I would, I'm okay with these cells being used for research. Um, but I think a lot of people, when they think of embryonic stem cells, they think that they are, it's like an actual, uh, you know, baby we're getting them from. And I think that's where the ethical implications come from. Um, but that's not like, we're not like taking babies and isolating cells from them, if that makes sense. Thank you. Um, another person has asked, asked, what is your vision for the future of 3D bioprinting? Oh, man. Uh, well, specifically for me, um, I guess my vision is that we would actually be able to print whole hearts on demand for people and we could implant them into people and reduce the organ shortage. Um, also help potentially those patients that have, um, you know, don't qualify for the wait list. So I kind of mentioned this, but there are a lot of people that are too sick and they actually don't qualify for the wait list. So they're unable to get a transplant. Um, and there are also people that are excluded because of, you know, either pre-existing conditions or something else. So they're excluded from the wait list. So I think this technology would actually help a lot of people um, and expand the wait list, if we could actually make these organs in an efficient manner that was cost effective um, and that they were just as good as a transplant. So that would be my vision for the future. Um, where we are on that path, I'm not sure. I think it would probably be at least 20 years, um, but it's exciting to think about. Yeah, that's very exciting. Um... We have another question coming in. What would you say the time commitment is for someone wanting to take on an endeavor like this? How much do the humanities play into such a revolutionary tool made to help people? Uh, the time commitment. Um, so what I can tell you is, at least for me, uh, I feel so passionate about what I do now that it doesn't feel like a time commitment. 
So, I mean, I work every, I work every day. I go in on the weekends, uh, but I love it. Uh, and I suggest that anyone who's listening to this should also equally find something that they love as much as that. So it doesn't feel like work. Um, so I can't really say the time commitment. Um, it's a lot of work, but it should be enjoyable at the same time. Um, and that's what I think any job should be. Um, what was the second question? How do humanities play into this? Yes, how much do the humanities play into such a revolutionary tool made to help people? Um, that's a good question that I don't really know if I have the answer to. I mean, I think ideally if the technology was um, fully created and we had all the tools to actually provide this to people that hopefully there would be people out there making sure that this technology would be equitable for um, everyone. Um, and I think a lot of people in this, uh, in this uh, call know that we still struggle with that in healthcare today. Like healthcare access is not equitable. Um, so I think humanities do play a big role. Um, and then hopefully at the point when this technology actually is at the point where we can actually make organs, that there are people that are trying to advocate for that. Indeed, um, this actually segues very well into another question that we've received. If slash when these hearts do become transplantable, do you think these transplants would be open to people of all socioeconomic levels? I would like to say yes. Um, but like I said in my previous, um, you know, and what I was previously talking about is we still struggle with trying to make ec uh, healthcare equitable. Um, I think it would be great if we could figure out a way to make that happen. Um, and I don't know what that would be, maybe subsidizing from the federal government to make sure that that all people can have access to them. Um, it could be people like you guys that are really interested in advocating for that because there's certain certainly policy um, decisions that need to be made on certain aspects of that. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think ideally that would be great, um, but we just need the people to actually make that happen. Yes, of course, thank you. And how far is 3D bioprinting human hearts, oh, 3D bioprinting hearts from human trials? <laughs> um, so right now we are, um, implanting those simplified contractile pumps into animals. So when you start, it's um, you start with like small animals um, and then you would do some studies in small animals and then ideally you'd move to a large animal. And then ideally you would move to a clinical trial uh, for safety at first. Um, and I think initially, if I had to guess, uh, this would be more offered as a assistive pump. So right now we have, um, there are uh, mechanical pumps that are used to assist the ventricle, um, but they can't really be implanted long-term. So I think this would be something like if your heart is failing, you might have an assistive pump um, in series with your heart to basically help it pump. Um, and then if those were successful, then I imagine uh, we, you could actually do uh, I get, get a little bit more complicated and then start to imprint, uh, implant more complex structures like potentially whole heart pumps. Um, but I would guess that it's gonna be at least 20 years if I had to guess. Thank you. And um, is there something about cardiac tissue that makes it easier to bioprint or harder to bioprint compared to others? What do would you say is the most, the easiest um, type of tissue to 3D bioprint? Hmm. So I think heart muscle is hard because um, I mentioned in some of the slides that there are, in the heart, it has, there's these basically aligned sheets um, that change direction um, throughout the heart, uh, the ventricle wall. Um, and actually fabricating something like that is fairly complex. 
Um, so we're trying to actually do simplified versions of that. Um, so in that ways, it's challenging. Um, in some other ways, uh, off the top of my head, so I was talking about induced pluripotent stem cells. So when we actually differentiate these into the heart muscle cells, um, they actually make heart muscle cells that are fa fairly immature. Um, so they're more like fetal heart muscle. Um, and that's kind of a challenge because some of the next work that we are really focusing on is basically trying to get these to become more adult-like. And what's kind of interesting is if you think about it, like how exactly do you make a muscle stronger? So a lot of our work has been focusing on actually uh, getting these tissues to pump against resistance or applying some sort of load. So they basically have to work against it. Um, and that's kind of like adjacent to if you go to the gym and you're lifting and you want to get stronger, you basically lift heavier weights progressively over time. So uh, there are a lot of challenges with printing heart muscle. I would say one nice thing about heart muscle, uh, because it's the heart muscle we print is immature, um, it does uh, display this spontaneous contractions, uh, which normally are seen in heart muscle, but it's because the nodal cells will depolarize the rest of the heart muscle. Um, in our heart, mu heart muscle cells, basically a lot of them have this spontaneous depolarization. So it's kind of nice. Uh, it's a good indicator that they're, uh, that I guess it's working, they're contracting. Um, so that's kind of a nice visual thing to look at. A lot of times with uh, tissue engineering in general, you don't really know if something's working until you basically stain it at the end and you look to see like, oh, is are the proteins that I wanted to express actually expressed in this tissue? Um, but we have a nice visual representation because it's actually contracting. Thank you. And what are some projects that you have in mind that you would like to do in the future? How much more or less effective is the 3D printed heart as a heart replacement in comparison to other replacements such as the pig to human heart transplant? Um, so I think I mentioned this earlier, but, uh, so the advantages of the Xeno transplantation is that basically you already have a fully functioning heart. Um, and kind of the disadvantages, I guess, would be the, basically, we're not really exactly sure if the, uh, I don't know if you guys, well, we're not really sure if it's, uh, completely stopping immune, uh, basically activity of, against the heart muscle, or I guess any tissue. Um, there are studies that have shown that like there still is some immune issues with that, um, but it's a fully functioning organ. So if you could figure out to how to make those organs immune privileged, that would be awesome. Uh, I would say the advantages for 3D bioprinting is that we could actually scan a patient, see what size their heart is, and actually if we could do all the things I'm saying, we could print a whole heart at the exact dimensions that we need for a specific patient with their specific cells. Um, so there would be pretty much no issues with uh, immune rejection. Uh, there wouldn't be any issues trying to size up what size heart we need. Um, and that's those are pretty good advantages, I would say. Um, what was the first part of the question? I forget. Yes. What are some projects that you have in mind that you would like to do in the future? Oh, man. Okay. Yeah, I wanted to share this with you guys today, but we're working on a paper with it. So I, I held off, but I will share a brief summary. Um, so what's really cool about heart, well, the heart when it develops is that it actually doesn't start like a whole fully formed heart. It actually starts as a tube uh, that basically bends and loops on itself to form its mature three-dimensional structure. And what's really cool about that is that during this process, uh, the heart's actually exposed to altered forces that help the heart muscle form correctly. Um, so I'm very interested in basically trying to take a tube and expose it to for similar forces that are observed during embryonic development to try to create a whole heart-like heart structure. Um, in the idea that it might actually uh, improve the function of the heart muscle. Like I said earlier, these cells that we use are very immature. 
And if we can use a way to basically mimic embryonic heart development, we might be able to make a more functional heart. Thank you. And um, any other last questions? We'll take one more question before we um, conclude for today. Any last questions? All right, I'll ask the last question. So um, I guess it's more of a thought, but I was thinking, is it possible to just print a 3D um, heart, a 3D bioprinted heart to use as a simulator for different conditions? Um, like what you previously mentioned, I think you said exposing it to different um, different environmental pressures. But for example, if you could expose it to different carcinogens and experiment with how um, different drugs could work on it instead of doing it on a person. So replacing human trials with um, 3D bioprinted hearts as simulations, what does that sound like to you as an idea? Um, that's an awesome thought. So that is something that I didn't talk about today, but we are very interested in. Um, so there are a lot, so, uh, there are a lot of cardiotoxic drugs. Um, so one thing that's very interesting, um, to me is that basically a lot of the cardiotoxic drugs, they, they test in animals, they see no signs of cardiotox cardiotoxicity. And then by the time they get to humans, oh, suddenly they see that they're cardiotoxic and then basically they're off the market. So if we can find a way to basically, uh, create these human specific models that are able to um, model these uh, toxicities, um, then basically you could replace animal trials, which I think would be very interesting um, in an ideal world, uh, you could replace animal trials. Um, so that's something we're very interested in. Um, and I think that's actually a great segue. Like if you could show that, uh, and a lot of people are working on this with simple, uh, in tissue engineering to create these heart muscle tissues that are either uh, respond to cardiotoxicity with doxorubicin, which is a known cardiotoxic agent, um, you basically could alleviate a lot of uh, the animal work that's actually done, uh, which I think would be very interesting. Um, and then another thing to think about is that certain patients respond to drugs better than others. Um, so if you could actually take patient-specific cells make a ventricle out of it and expose it to the drugs, you might be able to predict whether it works, uh, who it will work for and who it won't work for. And then you wouldn't waste your time basically trying it on the patient uh, without knowing if it's gonna work. Yeah, that's really cool. That, that's really interesting. And um, I would like to conclude our webinar for today as our time is almost up. Um, so thank you, Dr. Bliley, for spending time with us. This was such a wonderful opportunity to learn about 3D bioprinting. Um, we learned about things and I'm starting to see how what we're learning in class is connecting to what people are doing in real life. So for example, um, pluripotent cells, we recently learned about that in AP Bio actually. So I can finally use my knowledge. And um, do you have any concluding remarks for us? Um, no, if you guys want to, I mean, you have my email, if uh, people have additional questions, like they can definitely reach out to me. I'm always available by email pretty much. Uh, so yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, good luck with your, uh, future careers guys. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank You're welcome. You.